I'd like to welcome you all to this watch party on Human Rights Day 2020. My name is Louise Arimatsu, and I'm a research fellow based at the LSE Center for Women, Peace and Security. I'm going to be running through some preliminary housekeeping matters before handing over to our moderator, Professor Patricia Sellers. In terms of format, we've set aside 90 minutes in total for this event. The film will run for approximately 20 minutes. At the close of the film, Professor Sellers will be introducing the panelists who've been asked, among other things, to reflect on the film itself, as well as the broader legacies of the tribunal. About 20 minutes has been set aside for this conversation. We are, of course, keen to hear your views too. So we urge you to actively use the chat function on Zoom to share your views and to pose questions to the panel. During the last 30 minutes, Professor Sellers will be turning to your questions. Now for technical reasons, and as is standard practice, your videos have been turned off and your audio muted. That said, I also wish to draw your attention to the fact that this entire event is being recorded and will be posted online, including the Q&A session. So if you wish to stay anonymous, but would like to engage with us, please feel free to contact us outside of the event. This event today and the film that we're about to watch together was made possible by a grant from the European Research Council to the Gendered Peace Project, a four-year research project led by Professor Kachinkin. This project has given us, as legal scholars, an opportunity to think critically about what a gender peace might look like and how such a vision or visions might be secured, including through international law. And so it was within this context that we decided to revisit what happened two decades ago, to a moment in time where the potential for international law to deliver a gender just peace was realized, albeit fleetingly to a moment when a group of women who shared a belief in the transformative potential of the law took action, confronted by the catastrophic failure on the part of states to do what should have been done decades earlier. The Tokyo Women's International War Crimes Tribunal was not the first people's tribunal, although it was the first women's tribunal of its kind. And what is remarkable is the fact that the organizers managed to bring together a group of individuals who are intellectually at the cutting edge of legal thinking as scholars and as practicing lawyers. No more so, so than Professor Patty Sellers, who played a key role as one of the chief prosecutors for the tribunal. Now, as many of you already know, Patty is also the special advisor for gender for the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC. She's also a visiting fellow at Kellogg College, Oxford, and a practicing professor at the LSE. She was formerly the legal advisor of agenda and prosecutor at the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals. Patty will be leading the discussions following the film. We hope that this event will serve to inform, to inspire, to prompt questions, debates, and even motivate a new generation of activists to work to secure gender justice and a gender just peace. Thank you. This is an instance where women, non-governmental organizations did what governmental organizations failed to do even though there was sufficient evidence and that, it, is an opportunity uh, to set the record straight. When the Second World War ended, although the Allied forces knew that there were women who were kept in sexual slavery, patriarchal standards dominated and, and crimes against women were just hidden
We are marching on the street. There's no time, it's the time, my minister. They are already old. These women were all in their 80s when they started to come up. They were sick and they were dying. One of the comfort women said, you know, I'm coming out because I need to get my soul back before I die. Litigation was being commenced both in the Japanese court and in um, courts abroad, and essentially was getting nowhere. By 1998, you know, we were really frustrated that nothing legal was moving. Many of the women had come forward. They would talk about the horrific experiences. Academics would then talk about why those were breaches of international law. Activists would talk about what they wanted to do, but there didn't seem to be a change in the international community. And the women realized that they were ever going to have some sense of formal justice, that organizing a People's Tribunal would be the best way to go. The People's Tribunal is created by and for civil society. It's an assertion that law is not just for states, it's also for people. And in the case of this tribunal, women's civil society. This idea came from Japanese activist and journalist, Yayori Matsui. Yayori Matsui. Yayori Matsui came to me and said, Indai, we have to organize a war crimes tribunal. And it's really a tall order. She was very aware that we are perpetrated a country. That's the reason why we should do. I said to Yayori immediately, sure, why not? Okay, <laughs> just like that, no question. But that is how I think history is made. You don't ask too many questions. You just say, okay, let's do it. I was asking Yayori uh, after the tribunal, and the, how come you could get that such a high profile judges and chief prosecutors? I'm a civil rights lawyer who became an international judge. I went to law school in the turbulent 1960s in the United States for the express purpose of being a civil rights lawyer. So this gave me an opportunity to kind of renew my passion uh, in my youth, as well as perhaps filling some gaps that I knew uh, existed in the uh, state of the international criminal law at that time. I decided to join it myself as being a descendant of a slave and uh, everyone in the United States who's a descendant of a slave is more than likely a descendant of a female slave who has been sexually enslaved. So for me, there was a, a very natural uh, connection on a personal level. In addition to, this was really the area of my professional legal interest at that time. One of the reasons I was willing to be involved in the tribunal is that there was this sense in which Japan would never truly admit what had happened during the Second World War. And it just seemed like doing something that was more formal might have a greater impact. I got a phone call asking me if I would be involved and if I would consider becoming one of the panel of judges. The very fact that this was an initiative of a number of different women's organizations across Asia and so that it was very much coming from them. I mean, it was a huge honor to be asked by um, such people. They were looking for a man because they had three women already. I was working with Kenya Human Rights Commission where we were doing fantastic work on women's rights, gay rights. They asked me if I would, uh, you know, like to serve. And I said, yes, I was ready. The legal experts and scholars were what we now know and call allies. This was the start of my sort of human rights career. And just looking over the 20 years, this for me was one of the most incredible moments when civil society women leaders and activists, when legal scholars, when legal experts from around the globe, everybody came to Tokyo. We called it the Women's International Wire Crimes Tribunal.
It was led by women. It was about the issue of women, you know. It was not a Yugoslavia war crimes tribunal or a Rwanda war crimes tribunal. It was a women's tribunal that addressed one core issue, and that is sexual slavery, rape, mass rape, sexual violence, forced pregnancy in wartime. One of the things that really set this particular uh, People's Tribunal apart was the formal nature of the proceedings. That really came from the women. They felt that this was the only way that they would feel that they had justice. If something that had that very formal nature to it came to the conclusion that what had happened to them was a crime. Over in Tokyo, Japanese war criminals faced their trial led by... We lived in certain myths uh, about what happened in World War II. And if it didn't get to the Tokyo Tribunal, it didn't exist. Of course, we don't remember what was absent and what by all means could have and should have been there. The framing of the tribunal was as a continuation of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. We took a decision to only use the law that was applicable in 1945 to show that this very evidence at that time, in 1945-46, could have been adjudicated. The forum existed, the crimes had been committed, and could have been the basis of a conviction. Yes, there will be high military officials who are named in the indictments, as well as um, the Emperor Hirohito. Organizing the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal was really one of a kind. They worked across 10 countries to find the teams of prosecutors. In order to work together among 10 countries, of course, there were lots of uh, very tense moments. You think about lawyers from 10 different jurisdictions <laughs> discussing with one another <laughs> exactly how this is going to work. You can just imagine the discussions that took place. I could see them struggling and then achieving the ability to work harmoniously. And the fact that North and South Korea decided to become one team. I mean, that was just like, my gosh, and I was there. I can't stress enough the amount of work that went into this by... Historians and researchers digging into the military archives till eight o'clock. Everybody was working all the time. So there were at times so many um, different legal advisors, legal assistants, legal scholars, um, and diaries, as well as additional war documents. Other people were searching archives in London. There were hundreds of people behind the scene who worked towards that. Everybody was able to work through it and, of course, come to uh, an agreement about what the charter for the tribunal would be and an agreement that it would take place in Tokyo. As you have in, in many situations of mass atrocities, you have populists and people who deny that those atrocities ever took place. We were certainly very aware of a great deal of hostility. Um, in Tokyo. We had to be careful going out. Um, I had to be careful going into the tribunal each day. There were right-wing people demonstrating outside of the venue. Comfort women were prostitutes. Go back to your country, etc. You know, all kinds of um, hate speech and harassment. There were people outside not only protesting, but there were threats of harm. We knew we weren't welcome. And that was the, uh, the pleasure of that struggle. I, I felt like I always feel when I'm in a demonstration, you are emboldened, okay? Because you, you, you feel this is a cause you can die for. Holding it in not just Japan, but in Tokyo, in a, a city that was the city of empire, was courageous, it was brave, it was truth to power. Uh, and I think for the survivors and for the women who came forward, it was a means of saying, I am here, I exist. The opening reminded me of the Tadich trial's opening. 
because of the media, you know, and the number of uh, attendees. Kudan Kaikan Hall holds 1,500 people. The third tier of that hall was filled with the international media. The testimonies of the comfort women were really compelling. It was beyond measure to listen for each um, stories of the women coming from different nine countries with almost the same story of sexual slavery, how they were abducted, how they were taken from their houses, how they were brought to the, the Japanese garrison, how they saw their members of their family or their fathers and mothers being killed in front of them and then being dragged to the comfort station and being repeatedly raped every day. We are joined by country prosecutors. But I asked them to. I've seen their nine prices. country teams bring forward their individual cases. And uh, Tina and I, as co prosecutors, we were always on the stage. And so we could see just the, the, the buildup of the evidence legally and emotionally. The audience was hearing the culmination of the evidence for the first time. They might have known about one woman or one incident or one country, but all of a sudden, it's like the puzzle pieces were just falling together and the mosaic was being formed. And so when the judges brought their judgment forward, they kind of handed us back the package of rights that had been sought. Your honors, I would submit that Emperor Harahito might use many justifications for the roads to the comfort station. They all lead to slavery and rape and they all lead him to your judicial wisdom, which means a pronouncement of guilt. When the judgment was handed down, recognizing that sexual slavery was a crime against humanity. And then the second part of that was the recognition that Emperor Hirohito was responsible for that crime. I can remember where I was sitting in that pool. Um, I can remember the faces of the survivors. The audience suddenly started clapping and shouting and people stood up in their chairs um, and all the comfort women um, stood up and were celebrating. The comfort women went on stage and started crying. We all cried. It was almost like, um, we achieved justice. We really did. They, they achieved justice. We too felt we achieved justice. I mean, I remember that stage when all the women were crying, you know, and really crying, hugging each other and waving and, and saying, yeah, at last, now, you know, justice is done to us. You know, we have achieved justice in our lifetime before we die. I mean, even Patricia Sellers, we were all crying and hugging each other. And it's not as if we didn't know what the verdict was probably going to be. I mean, that's what we've been working on. But, I mean, your heart was still there the whole time. And so this is when the heart finally had a chance to kind of speak and release. And so I, I remember that moment as being just all consuming. That was televised, that that went global. Um, that was a moment of shame. Finally, not their shame, finally shame that globally, this was a failure of accountability on a, on a global scale. This is um, the judgment that was handed down. Have you ever seen this? Look, this judgment looks and purposely looks very similar to the judgments that were issued at the Yugoslav tribunal at the time of which I had tens of others. It's a solid, substantive judgment that each of the women received in The Hague, and I remember them clasping it to their breast. All rise. The judgment was handed down at The Hague in December 2001. That in itself says quite a lot. 
it was never done before, you know, that, you know, a group of women from nine countries come together and said, this is sexual violence in wartime. It is, it this happened 50 years ago and still happening today. What is the international community doing about it? We didn't tell you because we wanted to survive. Given my experience as a human rights activist, I knew you know, uh, that was the beginning of the struggle for the justice of these women. Japanese media was very much silenced afterwards. We tried the Emperor Hirohito and announced guilty. After that, it's more kind of um, backlash becomes much stronger. Politicians intervened, public broadcasting program before the, the program showed the portion that the Emperor Hirohito was guilty and was deleted. The testimony of the former soldiers deleted. The survivors from each country deleted. They only left Korean women on, only, meaning they're trying to make the issue between Korea and Japan not something broad. What happened and what has happened since then, you know, hasn't surprised me, you know. It's the impunity of ruling groups and uh, states and governments in this world. I already had been in hiding for about a month because of the threat from the right wing, threatening phone calls and then, you know, um, uh, well, we will uh, uh, bomb you, etc. A very, you know, dangerous threat. That right wing movement has continued. There's also been years of a government that's been absolutely unsympathetic um, to this issue. Looking back, of course, 9-11 happens, what? Um, nine months later. That was very much an end to that early optimism of the 1990s and a very changed environment as we then moved into the new century. In recent times, we have seen around the world a pushback against gender equality and women's rights. Moving on two decades now, um, a very big pushback against human rights, against women's human rights, against women human rights defenders. This issue um, that we try to resolve at the Women's Tribunal 20 years ago, it's still happening. So without the common concerted efforts, uh, this will not go away. It is not over. The fight continues still today. What some people may consider to have been a failure can be a positive because it shows the inaction in the face of an abundance of evidence that is recounted. It shows the continuing failure of the government of Japan to do what it should do, what it can do, and still. Any freedom, any rights that we are enjoying currently uh, is the result of the struggle of our sisters, our predecessors, our parents' generation. For every normative framework that is being recognized within the United Nations, there is a movement of women behind it that pushed for it and fought for it and talked about it. It was not like the United Nations one day said, ah, let's talk about women, peace and security. No, that never happened. It was the women activists like us out there in the picket lines, putting the rally, talking to the women who were victims of sexual violence that pushed the United Nations to recognize women, peace and security. In order to uh, go forward, we need to remember, we need to celebrate what we have achieved so far. He defined interpretations of humanitarian law and international law and human rights law. We gendered <laughs> the whole framework it also talks to what justice should look like. It centered victims within that process. 
And the International Criminal Court has gone on to do that. Our judgment, the Women's Tribunal judgment, is now being used by the ICC as one of the most gender judgment ever written. Judges continue that such gender blindness in international peace processes contributes to the continuing culture of impunity crimes perpetrated against women in armed conflict. It's a beautiful judgment. It is the most gendered interpretation of humanitarian law and international law. It redefined the notion of what would constitute accountability, compensation, and reparation in wartime. The International Women's Tribunal kind of pulled the curtain back to show what's always been there uh, but has been invisible in our legal jurisprudence. And once you open those curtains and see it, there's no going back. There's no going back. You can only go forward and build upon it. I would like to welcome everyone to our after the film discussion. I'm going to let everyone be able to maybe take a deep breath in order to have not only absorbed and felt again in our heart and our gut and in our head. Some of us might be angry when we see it. Uh, some of us might have other emotions, but I'm going to turn to our distinguished panelists first to ask them their reactions. Professor Christine Schenken, she's a professorial research fellow at the Center for Women, Peace and Security at London School of Economics. But of course, we all know Professor Schenken as one of the co-authors of the fundamental texts of the boundaries of international law. Uh, I think most feminists and most international scholars and practitioners have to read this book as they enter into the field. Christine was a judge at the Women's Tribunal. Christine, might I ask you first, what are your reactions after or upon seeing the film? Thank you, Patty. And first thing I'd like to say is to thank everybody who was involved in making the film and for participating in it. I think we were just all absolutely overwhelmed with um, the level of participation. Um, the emotions, um, the intensity of it again. And I think this um, balance between the very formal legal aspects and the very intense, emotional, heart-rending testimony that we were hearing. And I think the other uh, that really came back to me, as judges, we weren't involved at all in the organization. It was The organizers were very clear that we were to be kept separate, we were to be impartial, we weren't to be involved in that. And then looking at the documentary, just the level of organization that the organizers and the work that they put in, I think they thought of every detail, how to ensure the testimony of the women, how the Japanese government's arguments would be put, um, how the written evidence would be brought alongside and to support the oral evidence. And it was just an extraordinary feat that the organizers put together. And I think that really came back watching the video again. Absolutely. Uh, I'm now going to turn to the Honorable uh, Gabrielle Kirk McDonald. And Judge McDonald was the former president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And she's been a judge in several other jurisdictions, usually and always a first among women and among African-American women to hold any of these positions. Uh, judge McDonald was also a judge at the Women's Tribunal. 
And so I'm going to ask you now, after having seen this wonderful film, what are your reactions or reflections upon it? Thank you, Patty. Um, and uh, I also want to welcome not only our participants, my fellow participants, but all of the viewers. You know, I, as I looked at it, I was almost overcome with love. You know, when you see the comfort women, euphemistically comfort women, express this joy in, in the tribunal, in the fact that they have the opportunity to, after 50 years or more of being silent, having to be silent, and this, they were so appreciative for the opportunity to just tell their story, to just say what had happened to them. And you know, when they testified and, and as I watched them celebrate, it makes me feel strong. It makes me feel that if they went through this, and they were satisfied with only an opportunity to tell their story, how strong can they be? And it, it was like a reunion. I, as I saw many of our fellow participants uh, in the film, it just made me smile because it brought back memories of the good times that we had, even though the subject matter was harrowing. Uh, we were all working hard together we felt like we were really accomplishing something. And it, it touches me, it touches me. Um, and, and Christine, like you, I was reminded, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was reminded of the outstanding work that you did. I, mean, well, I think it, it's uh, uh, to uh, apply a, a very common uh, message right now. That was good trouble. We were doing a lot of good trouble during that process. I now want to turn to Ms. Indai Sajour. And uh, for over 30 years, Indai Sajour has been an activist, an organizer, a steadfast worker. She's worked um, with the program manager for UNDP, Afghanistan, Somalia. She's worked in the Middle East. Um, I believe that Indai is the first person I met who asked me to uh, participate in the Women's Tribunal. And Indai, I have to say that I didn't know you then, but thank goodness you left your identity card for some reason in my office. And I never forgot the name afterwards. <laughs> what are your reflections or any of your thoughts after seeing the film? Thank you. Thank you, Patty. I think, you know, after watching the film, it, it really brought so much memories and all the hard work of all the victimized countries, you know, and more importantly, again, to see the faces of friends and colleagues who made this possible. But I would first like to acknowledge uh, LSE uh, for really organizing this event and the effort that was put in this. Uh, thank you very much uh, for initiating it. And secondly, I would just like to acknowledge uh, my co-conveners of the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal, Yayori Matsui from Japan, who is not with us anymore, and to Professor Yun chung -ok, from South Korea, who is now in her 90s. I really miss both of them because it should be recognized that the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal was a movement. It was a feminist movement of women from 10 countries coming together you know, to find justice uh, for these women. And this film has brought back you know, the energy and and the determination to put justice where it should be for the women. You know, one of the things that we really realize is that when Yayori Matsui asked me to do a tribunal, and I said, yes, right away, you never say no to Yayori. The background behind it is nine years before we organized a tribunal, we were all filing cases at the Tokyo District Court. 
South Korea filed a case. The Philippines filed a case. There is no statutes of limitation at the Tokyo District Court. So we legally filed a case, you know, in Japan. We brought the comfort women to Japan to testify in the legal Tokyo District Court. And so Taiwan, North Korea, um, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, we all filed cases at the Tokyo District Court. And of course, you know, we're filing against the Japanese government in their court. So it was not even a question whether we're going to win it or not. We won it. The mere fact that the comfort women went to Japan, filed the case against the Japanese government, that movement started it all. And so it led towards organizing the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal, which really culminated in terms of the legal struggle of why it's important for them to realize that justice has been done. If the Thank government you so much. I, I appreciate um, not only your recognition that the movement behind it and the feminist movement, and if I can interject just for a second as a moderator, my reflections on the film is that it was wonderful not only to see the women, but to see the different legal teams. Um, like many of you, I've spent uh, over two decades in international justice, but this was where you really had national teams who came together for a common international purpose. And I would like to add that the national teams are made up of males and females of uh, different generations, and it, worked toward cohesion because the aim was justice for the comfort women. So I'd like to also see if Sophie uh, Malay, who is a filmmaker, if she's on the call, if she could just pop into our conversation for a couple minutes and please explain to us a bit of your um, feelings, but maybe background professional in terms of making this film. I would love to pop in. Thank you for the <laughs> invitation. Um, well, for me, uh, I did my first interview with Indai, and from that moment, I was like, "Holy moly, this is this is a big this is a big thing." So from the the very get go, every interview after that, I got the same sense of goosebumps throughout the interview. It was a huge thing to be invited into and to be told about, and for people to trust their kind of recollections. And the reactions that you have to the film were very much the reactions that I got in the interview. The memories were very fresh. And everybody who was interviewed for the film had such, um, for lack of a better word, tenderness towards what happened 20 years ago. And I think, you know, looking at the chat from the event today and the event that we did on Tuesday as well, 20 years later, there's so many people who were involved then and are here to remember it now. So like that uniqueness that came through in the interviews was something that I really wanted to capture in the documentary. I will say that this is a very small, small, tiny part of the story. Um, I spoke to everybody for an hour each and that was only a small number of the people that we could have interviewed for the documentary. So there could be thousands of documentaries that are made about this and I hope that there are in a way, because it is such a unique thing that happened from so many different aspects. But our job was to tell the legal story. And um, there were many different facets of that legal story that came out. But I think the strongest were the fact that it was just a miracle of organization. It was this miracle of like international solidarity. And I know that there's lots of people that I've invited to watch the film and that I've invited to the event today who have nothing to do with international criminal law. But I think, you know, an event that was, yeah, I wanted to tell the story of like solidarity, feminist struggle. And I think that's such an important story to still be telling 20 years later. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to switch back and excuse me, I'll let everyone know that I'm now going to refer to our wonderful esteemed panelists uh, by their first names because we're, we're friends too. So I'm going to turn to Gabby. And Gabby, a question I'd have for you is that what do you think was the underlying importance of the Women's Tribunal from a gender justice perspective? Uh, you hear that phrase gender justice uh, throughout um, throughout the years. But what do you think the tribunal's uh, importance was, uh, even looking back now to what we call or refer to as gender justice? I 
I think you might be on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, I was uh, one of the original judges at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which uh, 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 is the first international tribunal really uh, established uh, by uh, the United Nations or the international community. Mm -hmm. And I recall that when we were drafting our rules of procedure and evidence, the judges that is, were, were drafting the rules of procedure and evidence, we wanted to assure that a fair trial was given. Because if a fair trial was not given, then our findings, whether guilt or innocent, uh, would not be respected. So that was very, very important. Um, as I came to this tribunal, uh, even though it is not a tribunal constituted by law, uh, it, is, it, is, it, it was created based upon the um, intrinsic power of civil society. Um, I wanted to accomplish the same thing, and that is to provide a fair trial. At the conclusion, and you had asked me to address really the importance at the time, at the conclusion of the uh, two-day hearing, uh, and we then uh, issued the preliminary findings, I was convinced that we had provided this fair trial. And it's important because the tribunal, the women's tribunal is using, wants to be, uh, is designed to be a moral force. And that moral force has to be respected. And it came from a thorough hearing of the evidence and the application of the law that existed at the time of the Tokyo Tribunal uh, to those facts. I was impressed uh, tremendously with the way that Endai and the other members of the IOC crafted the tribunal. It brought back to me um, the way that we conducted trials at the ICTY. For example, we had a proceeding under one of our rules, Rule 61, where we could hear evidence without the presence of the accused if the accused had failed to attend. We then would do present the indictment and present evidence. And this reminded me of that type of proceeding. Mm -hmm. So I was impressed with that. And secondly, I think that the importance that I felt at the time was that as Endai has said, this was a tribunal that was created by women's organizations and that was led primarily by women. And that's important because women have been invisible in international law and were the worst of the tribunal uh, rubs off on all of us, all women who are trying to take their place uh, in international law. Yeah, I, th I think you're right because the tribunal is historically situated and it relates to women before it and certainly women afterwards. Um, I wanna now turn to Christine. Uh, Christine, there's been a couple of slight references to the judgment. But could you maybe tell us, you know, from a legal point of view, what was innovative, what was traditional, where would you situate uh, this legal document today? Thank you again, Patty. Um, well, of course, the most innovative is what um, both Gaby and Indai and the documentary itself says. It was a feminist judgment. And it really weaves throughout the whole legal analysis the importance of taking into account women's voices and especially marginalized women, women who came from um, groups within their societies who were in various ways, either because they were ethnically different, because they were poor, because they were from occupied countries, they were colonial, um, colonized Japan being at that point the colonial power with um, Korea and Taiwan. So it was bringing their voices forward, which is something that you just very rarely see in legal judgments. But more legalistically, and I think what's really important about the judgment legally is the point that Gaby has just made, that it was the law 
as it was in 1945. And this builds from the innovation that the International Women's Tribunal was a continuation of the IMTFE as it sat in 1945, 1946, in the immediate aftermath of World War II. It was, um, and there's been quite a lot of legal writing around this, it was an as if, as if that tribunal had done its job properly and considered these additional crimes that were not part of the indictment back in 45, 46. That meant the law had to be the, the law of 45. And so the emphasis on the Hague regulations of 1907 on the customary international law relating to slavery. Um, the law was there. It was absolutely there. It just needed to be brought out. But then what was further innovative was that some of the legal developments that were happening at that time, in particular before the ICTY, as Gaby again has just mentioned, shows this continuity of the law. There was nothing, although it was innovative, there was nothing that wasn't grounded in existing law. Mm. And so I think that really brings out that any tribunal can do this. We weren't creating law, we were applying what was there and the further development showed this continuity. And I think that was really important. A um, couple of other, it was innovative in that it brought together state responsibility, state responsibility for violations of human rights mm -hmm. with international criminal liability for it, those who individually um, were criminally responsible for the commission of those crimes, including, of course, the Emperor Hirohito and the um, charges and bringing the discussion of the superior responsibility of the Emperor Hirohito as the supreme power in Japan, I think, again, was um, innovative. And perhaps just one last one, the state of Japan in conjunction with the various allied powers in the peace treaties that followed World War mm -hmm. II had essentially said, this is final settlement. There are to be no more claims. We have dealt with this issue. And I think what the tribunal says very strongly is these were crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity by their very definition do not concern just the individuals, they concern humanity. And humanity suffers when those crimes are committed with impunity and without accountability. And no state should be able to waive its accountability for crimes against humanity. And I think that is a very powerful statement as well. Well, you're making me think that in some ways it was very innovative, but it looks like that the tribunal and the, the legal boundaries, if I can use you know, the words from your uh, book, were really uh, grounded and respected. Yes. I mean, we, we applied the law that should have been applied. And it was basically a reopening of the Tokyo Tribunal. And it Which, wasn't something of 1990s or 2000, you know, bowing to political correctness, if I understand you. Which goes back to Gaber's point of a moment ago, that for legitimacy and credibility for a fair trial, we had to have that grounding in the international law. And as I said, it just shows that the law is there, it can be used, it can be made to work and made to work in ways that bring, to go back again to your own words a moment ago, gender justice. Right. Okay, Indai, uh, you've told us that this is actually the result of a social movement, of a feminist social movement. And let's be very clear, a feminist social movement that took part very much in Asia and Australia and then within the diaspora. And I'm just wondering, could you tell us now what occurred prior that brought the feminist movement to that point and what has occurred since then? Thank you. Thank you, Patty. I will build on to what Gabby and Christine were saying. But more importantly, I think we should recognize that this was the 1990s. Yeah. And in only in 1993, at the UN World Conference on Human Rights, uh, in Vienna that women's rights as human rights were recognized. 
So historically, when you look at it, the first comfort women, Kim Hak Sung from South Korea, came mm -hmm. out in 1992. So there was already a movement, a women's movement globally fighting for women's human rights, which was only recognized by the United Nations in 1993 in Vienna. And so that momentum evolved towards our action in the Asia when the first comfort women came out and when all the women, the feminist women, the women's rights activists in 10 countries in Asia, and I would like to name them, South Korea, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Netherlands, China, Taiwan, um, East Timor, the Philippines, and, um, and uh, North Korea. So there was a movement of justice that already was agitated from the 1993 World Conference on Women's Human Rights. But what is really compelling in this process was the determination of both men and women to bring justice to the comfort women. So there was a movement behind it. And as I was saying, nothing would have been achieved if there was no movement. Because I very well remembered when we were drafting, when we decided to organize the tribunal, it came out of a process of already a legal proceeding that happened in Tokyo, which all the victimized countries brought to the Tokyo District Court which went to the high court and eventually to the Tokyo Supreme Court. So that involvement of legal process was already set in place, you know, among the lawyers who work with us and continued to work with us in organizing the tribunal. But what is compelling is that we wanted to make this a real tribunal. And so there was a lot of respect into the process, even if 10 countries with different legal jurisdiction have to come together and agree on the charter. So I remembered when we were writing, it took one year yeah, for the charter of the tribunal to be codified because we had meetings among the lawyers, uh, human rights activists and legal experts. You know, the preparation of the statutory construction of the charter of the tribunal was really immense, yeah? We met in Shanghai, we met in Tokyo, we met in Seoul and eventually in Manila where it was approved by all the countries. I remembered feminist lawyer Noor Shabani from Indonesia was debating, you know, with the North Korean lawyers on the agreement on the statutes, debating, you know, it was real. And she was saying that judges will not take this if we push for um, war crimes and genocide because it was not in the 1945 law. So there was that debate. And at one point, North and South Korea had a different determination on how it should go. And they were always thinking behind their back, would the judge the judges consider this. And eventually, as you, Patty, were there, and you know very well, you were there to navigate all of these 10 countries and all these legal minds and lawyers and activists that we eventually come together uh, to put it. And behind that framework, remember, I would just like to make note that when we were filing the legal case in Tokyo, the comfort women were always with us. They, they, you know, from their villages that they have never left, we flew them to Tokyo. You know, I mean, the, the comfort women were always with us into this process. They were part of the movement. They knew we were working with them and they had a say in it. And so that was really important. And if I can just interrupt you there, I mean, briefly speaking about the comfort women and their accompaniment of the entire process. Well, now we know that many of those comfort women have passed on during the past uh, 20 years. And so where is the movement situated now? Well, you know, we have to recognize that majority of the comfort women have died. As a matter of fact, um, one of the last remaining comfort women in Taiwan um, died last week, 
Uh, and we honor her. There is only one um, Taiwanese comfort women um, that is still alive. And a number of them in the Philippines, in, 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 in South Korea, in, in all the victimized countries, most of them died. And the activists informed us when they all pass away and we honor them. Where the movement is now, the movement is still there. You know, the, the energy is still there. In Japan, we have the Women's Active Museum that continues to bring the issue of the comfort women and to make it uh, available to the Japanese uh, population to look at. In South Korea, the longest um, picket that is being done in front of the embassy for history. There is no more longer picket being done than the one that is being done in South Korea in front of the Japanese embassy, which by the way has become a tourist attraction every Wednesday. But the point is the movement is still there. We are still here and the continuing process of the legacy of the comfort women is not just what we have achieved, but what we should do in the future for the, okay, so the activism continues. I mean, it takes on a different form or different change and also takes on a, a very real tone of honoring and respecting the spirits of the comfort women. Uh, Christine, I wanted to ask you something because uh, we, we've seen that activism very much was the engine, I think, with the Women's Tribunal and then all the other actors, judicial actors or practices and academics came in. How do you see uh, the Women's Tribunal, uh, Christine, how do you see that intersecting with uh, feminist peace activism, either of today or, or before? Because you mentioned in the movie that uh, without a gender justice, you won't have peace. You have to unmute, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Patty. And again, a question that we could really discuss, I think, for, at length. Um, Inda began with the 1990s, and you've mentioned the Vienna Conference in 1993. But of course, women's peace activism goes way, way back, certainly to the start of the 19th century. And we see it the, um, during the First World War. There was the International Women's Congress in The Hague in 1915. In while the war was actually ongoing, essentially where women gathered together essentially to both um, claim, argue for their own rights, particularly to political participate for the vote, suffrage, obviously at that time, but also for peace and made the very strong assertion that war can never be made safe for women and that mm -hmm. militarization the need to um, have weapon, um, weapon control, weapon regulation, all of those issues are absolutely crucial alongside issues relating to justice for those who have become victims in particular wars. 1919, again, women came to Zurich, this time to decry the Treaty of Versailles as a, a, an instrument that was not going to bring peace and never would bring peace. And of course they were right the creation of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom that stemmed from those two events. And if we then sort of do a big jump in decades, we come to the 1990s, not just the events that Indai has just described so fully, but also the move for women, peace and security. So again, in October of 2000, just two months before the tribunal, we get again at the instigation of women's civil society, the Security Council adopting the Women, Peace and Security Resolution 1325, since been followed by another 10 resolutions. And it's just really noticeable that what is being asked for in the Women, Peace and Security agenda goes right back to what the women in 1915 asked for, what the comfort women are asking for. What women want is participation, women's meaningful participation mm -hmm. across all decision-making, not just criminal justice decision-making, political decision-making, planning for peace, um, peace building in multiple different ways, accountability, impunity, working with civil society, not to have top-down movements. The mm -hmm. fact that the WPS, Women, Peace and Security Resolutions are in the Security Council does not mean that it is, should be top-down from the Security Council telling women what to do. It should always be bottom up, the participation of women, the involvement of women, and as I said earlier, especially marginalized women 
bringing them together in several people have said solidarity but the solidarity across all of those i think what perhaps has now got lost certainly in the security council and that um again particularly the women's international league for peace and freedom um is extremely strong on advocating for and we also saw this in the 2015 global study on women peace and security is no to militarization um, again, it comes very powerfully out of the documentary, I think, that mm -hmm. militarization, militarism is, of course, um, very much part of what leads to injustice, sexual violence, and that needs to be addressed if we're really taking seriously ideas of gender justice. So it's, uh, the militarization is not on the antithesis of, of peace, but we can see with the comfort women, it was because of the armed conflict, you know, in its root military, that they were to serve military forces. And um, that military issues were given priority. Yes, over, over the lives of the women. Absolutely, constantly. yeah. Right. Well, uh, Gabby, I wanna to turn to you now because as you noted in the film, and as you've said, you participated in the US civil rights movement, uh, the establishments of courts and tribunals, uh, kind of the reckoning, the racial justice uh, ongoing forever perennial project uh, within the United States. Uh, and also, I think it's interesting for us to understand that World War II in both the European theater and in the Asian theater was really a race war of two countries claiming that they were the superior race in their regions. So I wanna know what political or emotional parallels do you feel between those instances of the comfort women's struggle and the search for racial justice or the reckoning within the United States? Thank you, Patty, uh, once again for that, uh, I suppose, a difficult question, uh, but important question. I think that there are parallels, and unfortunately, each of those movements, and as Zendai said, it's a women's uh, comfort women are now in a women's movement, but all of them, all of them share a characteristic, and that is that there is unfinished business and that there is much work left to be done. I think that the Women's International Tribunal went as far as it could in providing a fair trial, as, as I indicated. And gathering uh, the evidence, making a historical record to guard against revisionism, which still exists. Uh, school books uh, tell a different story, an untrue story about the comfort women, or they're left out totally. So all, th all three, both the former Yugoslavia civil rights uh, in, our, in my country, in the United States, and the situation for comfort women is in that, in that uh, situation. Um, but uh, it seems to me that there are some parallels. Um, Golard Teal Butcher, who is a noted black woman, she's deceased now, black woman lawyer, scholar, professor, said that human rights are civil rights written on the international stage. So there is a lot of similarity and I tried to bring that home, I suppose, when I presided over the Tadich trial. I remember one of the witnesses who testified was a reporter from Belgrade. And he was trying to analogize the conflict in the former Yugoslavia with the situation, the racial situation in the United States. And he said, he testified that if David Duke uh, had assumed control of all of the media in the United States, and we were constantly uh, barraged by uh, this propaganda that they're coming to get you, the Muslims are coming to get you, the Croats are coming to get you, the Serbs are coming to get you, you too would have war. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, you know, that sounds familiar in a sense to where we are in the United States. Um, but I suppose the emotional parallel is, is, is what, again, Endai has been saying. 
it's the passion, it's the, it's the belief that we will keep going and that we will not give up. We will not give up. And that I think is, is uh, applicable uh, to all three instances. In the former Yugoslavia, it has returned to the nationalism that existed before the war and before the tribunal issued uh, so many judgments. So there's a lot to be done uh, with the civil rights movement. Uh, the protests uh, really are an in the United States are an example of this unfinished business. And there's unfinished business for the comfort women, but we're not giving up. All we have to do is to see <laughs> the film showing the enthusiasm and strength uh, and tenacity of the comfort women. Uh, and it, it emboldens us to go forward and to push for these things. The, the fine thing, one of the fine things about the judgment of the tribunal is that it went further than um, uh, traditional judgments, even the ICTY. And Christine has spoke, spoken very well on it, but the relief that the comfort women uh, were receiving wanted to receive was much broader. They wanted a frank, full, genuine apology from Japan mm -hmm. as to what their experiences were. That has not happened. Uh, they wanted, and it is included in the judgment, reparations, full reparations. That's not happened. Uh, they wanted uh, an establishment of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That has not happened. And then the ultimate, I suppose, and this is true of uh, all of the movements that we've talked about, is that what we said in the judgment is, and I quote now, it is our hope that the moral force of this women's tribunal and this judgment will engage states as well as people of the world to bring Japan to recognize its responsibility to repair these atrocities to right these wrongs and to enable future generations to go forward on the basis of respect for women's equality and dignity. That's what we all want, whether you're talking about the civil rights movement, whether you're talking about uh, denials of religious freedom in the former Yugoslavia, dignity, respect, equal treatment, that's not so hard. Well, apparently it appears to be very hard, but I think uh, <laughs> what you're saying is that I am you and you are me and we are each other. Well, uh, look, my fellow sisters, we could go on in this conversation, but I think there's an audience who's also out there that would like to ask a couple questions. So let me turn to some of the questions that have come forward. Um, one is from Stephanie Lee and the question is, do you have any recommendations for how activists and educators could better emphasize the significance of state legal responsibility and the colonial sovereignty? Uh, I'm also interested in any thoughts that you might have from a legal perspective about the deal in 2015 that was announced between Japan and Korea. So uh, ladies, put up your hands if you want to take it a part of this or not. It's very interesting. Activists and then educators. It's good to have brought that in. Uh, and the maybe legacies of colonialism. And I? Yeah. Well, I, I think, it, thank you, Patty. I think it's, it's a very compelling uh, question because of the fact that we are always wanting to put uh, state responsibility and state accountability. And rightfully so, we should be doing that for whatever violence and crimes committed in situations of war or armed conflict. But we also have to realize up to this day, <laughs> that even with the establishment of the International Criminal Court, we are still being challenged to put states for their accountability. And I think this is what the, the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal has, has, has really set forward. You know, the, the challenges of making the state accountable for the crimes that they have committed against the people, against the women, by their forces, by the rebel groups, non-state actors, all of this in, in collaboration. So when, when we analyze state accountability, we have to look further than state accountability. 
And the reason for that is because our international justice mechanism, even with the international criminal court, is still being challenged. You know, the, and that is why the initiative of the Women's Tribunal was a success. I would say it was justice. We do not have to go into the legal framework if we are just banging the wall that will not recognize it. One of the lessons learned, and this was very well described by Gabby and Christine and all my colleagues, was that what kind of justice it brought to the former comfort women what kind of satisfaction it brought to them. Because I remembered when, that, when Gabi said the judgment in The Hague and in Tokyo, the, the impact into the lives of the comfort women was much more important. You know, it changed the women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, 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 they openly said, now we can die in peace, you know? And this is where it becomes very important because one of the lessons that the Comfort Women Movement has taught me, and this I have to say, I have been waging war against peace. Really, mm -hmm. I am waging war against peace. Why? Because what is really peace? What does peace mean? You know, peace because the, the guns have stopped shooting, the bombs have stopped falling. There's no peace in that. Just because an agreement and a peace process has come into being and there is peace? No. My waging war against peace because there is no peace without justice. And that comfort women struggle showed us that they never had peace after the war, after the International Military Tribunal of the Far East, they totally ignored the violence that was done to women. And that was why we all came together and said, this is not right, we should correct the history. And that is why the Women's Tribunal is correcting the historical wrong, which Gabby very well said, and make it into the context of where it is today. And so we need to redefine peace in the context of justice. Right, do any of the other panelists, Gabby or uh, Christine? Christine, please. The mute, the mic. You have to unmute. Sorry, them. yes, I always forget about the mic. Um, coming at it as an educator, um, and sort of university um, sort of aspect. Um, although I, I would say, it's the importance of not separating education and activism. I think, again, mm. what the tribunal showed was just how important it is for people from all these different areas to come together and work together. But also the importance of feminist methodologies, feminist, what Cynthia Enlow is called feminist curiosity. Um, Indai has just given a very good example of it. We need to challenge what is meant by peace. We need to challenge from a feminist perspective, how we understand the various concepts that are so often included in university education without that critical challenge. We're seeing it now with a great deal of the post-colonial um, work challenging the narratives of colonization and imperialism. But I think we still need to add the feminist um, lens into those particular challenges. And I think alongside that, feminism challenges the classic categories. So rather than saying this is just about international law, just about internationally humanitarian law, just about human rights law, um, turn it round on its head. Say from the perspective of the survivors, what do those categories mean? They mean absolutely nothing. What it means is let's start from their experiences. What is it that is preventing the justice being accorded to them. Let's challenge all of those obstacles from that feminist lens and come up with an answer um, with a strategy, with tactics for achieving uh, those in different ways. And I think that's very much part of education as well as activism. Thank you. Look, there's a second question and it ties a little bit into these general comments that we're making. And, and that is from Catherine O'Rourke, did any of the panelists feel actually constrained by limiting uh, yourselves to the 1945 uh, law coming out from the original uh, Tokyo Tribunal? And is there a type of tension of wanting to legitimize yourself uh, by using a law that maybe isn't as applicable as we seem to be um, 
asserting that it is? Are there some more fundamental deficiencies in that law that maybe we should have had more in mind? Maybe, Gabi? Yeah. Well, if not, I'd like to uh -huh. answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna take the prerogative. Right. Um, <laughs> that after all of these years, when I look at the uh, judgment, and I think the judgment is absolutely wonderful, but we also look at the um, experience of women and in particularly uh, women who have been placed uh, in what I call sexualized enslavement, that neither of the um, international military tribunals, Norberg or Tokyo, really had a specific uh, crime that related to slave trading. Because what comes out in the yeah. evidence when you read it is that the women were abducted, they were kidnapped, they were transported, um, they were um, through subterfuge uh, made to come into these various comfort stations. And while in the Nuremberg judgment or London charter, you have deportation to slave labor, our whole mixed notion of, well, is, is sexual slavery really labor or is it really enslavement or what? But we kind of jumped over that, that deportation um, now, I would have considered that and probably would have asked the nine country uh, prosecutors to also put forward a charge of slave trading that they did with these women by bringing them into the system and then transporting them around from comfort station to comfort station. And that's when you transport someone already enslaved to a different slavery situation. So looking back now, I feel that, yes, there might have been a constraint um, with just how we interpreted some of the 1945 law. But there was also uh, a need to somewhere legitimize within the international legal community of the 1990s, which was looking so much at international criminal law for the first time, that these were real crimes that could have had criminal law solutions. Can I just- and Pat, oh, go ahead, Anton. Yeah, no, go just- on. Go Gabby, go Gabby, then we'll switch back to- Patty, you. I just wanted to put in a plug for the, a wonderful uh, law review article that you've written on that subject. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And if it has whetted any, if, if your if, uh, intervention has whetted anyone's appetite, you, you might tell them where they could find it in a further discussion. Right, the International Journal of Criminal Justice. And then there'll be a forthcoming book in which uh, Christine is participating to a feminist uh, critique of international uh, law again this spring. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Yeah, and I? Yeah, no, I was just about to add on because we're talking of the crimes here. And I think one of the things that um, the comfort women testimony has taught us from, you know, as, as Christian said, the feminist uh, interpretation of humanitarian law and international law and all the crimes committed against women. You know, the testimonies of the comfort women, how they become sex slaves. You know, we realize just listening to their testimonies that there was more than one crime that was committed from each comfort women. It was not just sexual slavery. There was abduction, mm -hmm. you know, there was rape, there was torture, there was mutilation, there was trafficking. So when you look at it, there was more than one crime committed against each of the comfort women. It was not just sexual slavery. They were repeatedly raped, which was the essence of sexual slavery, which by the way, we brought the language to the United Nations. But more importantly, most of them were trafficked. The South Korean women went to Burma, you know, the, the mm -hmm. Philippine women went to Taipei, you know, all of this, they were they were part of a system that have created such horrendous violence against them. They were tortured, they were mutilated, they were, they were forced into abortion, they were forced into pregnancy. So when you put all this crime, there was more than one crime committed against each of the comfort women. And those testimonies defined it and our critical thinking and feminist thinking allowed us to say, yes, there was more than one crime. Yeah. So actually the judgment is, is but a slither or a fine uh, you know, dissection of the multitude of crimes that occurred. Look, we have another question that's come up and it says that they see some parallels. Uh, this is from uh, Ninika Grossman. I see some parallels to the shortcomings of courts in the Me Too context. 
And do you think that such a woman's tribunal would be helpful in the Me Too context uh, that women are expressing around the world today in terms of sexual assaults or harassment uh, and basically in the non-armed conflict context? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I agree. And that's a very good question. Um, you can see what, what was done in, in um, our, our judgment, as, as I pointed out. Um, uh, we were more creative and more complete, I think, in, in providing uh, remedies. Again, though, you know, it was a moral force that we had as opposed to the force of law. Uh, but even when there's the force of law, uh, as I said, there's a lot of unfinished, unfinished business that have uh, that has um, had the benefit of uh, legal judgment. Can I come in on that uh, on that as well? Um, there, uh, throughout the 1990s, there were a number of occasions. I think at Vienna, at Beijing, other occasions as well, where large numbers of women came and gave oral testimony about what had happened, particularly sexual violence and armed conflict. And I think that one of the great things that a People's Tribunal could do around the Me Too movement is to show the extent of it, the um, holistic nature, how frequently the same stories get repeated, how very often it's the same actions, the same power imbalances that we see at play leading to the various forms of harassment mm -hmm. and so on. And oh, one case before the court, you know, even if it's an important case, such as the Harvey Weinstein case, inevitably is just about that one particular context, film director and so on. Whereas what a tribunal could do would be could bring multiple contexts and yet show at the same time that what we are actually seeing is the same thing being repeated. Exercise of power, um, lack of accountability, impunity, um, and so on. And I think that would be very, very powerful. Okay, well, on to the next tribunal. Look, I'm going to <laughs> now uh, allow each of you to have a bit of closing um, words, but I'm, I'm going to take the privilege of directing some of the closing words. I'd like to know, Indai, could you speak uh, briefly on what do you think um, uh, right now should be uh, done to carry on this legacy of the Women's uh, Tribunal? Any concrete solutions or ideas? Well, yeah, thank you, Patty. Um, you know, the, the judgment gave 12 recommendations. I think we all remember those 12 recommendations <laughs> that the judges have, have given us. And one of those uh, recommendations is even the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to ensure that the historical records of the comfort women during, you know, during that time, uh, the transition and the occupation and the colonization should be put in place. And that was one of the compelling recommendations by the judges. And the other one was, of course, to honor the victims and survivors through the creation of memorials, museums, and libraries dedicated to their memory. You know, and as we say, the promise of never again. And this never again is more important than it is today because we have seen the Yazidi women in Iraq also uh, subjected to sexual slavery in this you know, 21st century. And that should not happen again. Then of course, this one, we have to have both the formal and informal educational initiatives with the judges so way ahead that should be really uh, put into the textbooks, you know, in different mm -hmm. countries about what happened um, during the Second World War. Because this, is, happened, this is part of our history. This is part yeah, of world part of our history. history. This is not yeah. the secret. Okay, I'm going to ask Christine. Christine, what do you think the legacy of the tribunal should be uh, today as we go forward? Oh, can I just um, make a plug, though, just to, um, on what Indai says? We have actually put up on the website of the um, Center for Women, Peace and Security extracts from the judgment, including mm. the recommendations, because I think it is quite often inaccessible and people might you know, want to have at least um, the core, the sort of some of the key essence of it. Um, what's the legacy of it? I think twofold. One is keep on resisting keep on um, resisting against all the pushback that we are seeing at the moment, that the lesson that even if something happened 
50 years ago as it was in 2000, when we had the tribunal, 70 years ago now, that doesn't mean that it should get forgotten. That historical record is important, that historical record based upon the testimony of the survivors and then argued in such a way as to show the importance of all the things that Indai's just been talking about and the, the whole package that might amount to justice shouldn't and cannot be forgotten. But then to add on, we have this Women, Peace and Security agenda from the Security Council, 20 years as well, same length of time as the tribunal. And in that we see um, states making commitments that they just as quickly forget about and don't follow through on. And so many of the issues that are contained within that agenda are set out and that they should therefore be um, put into effect. They shouldn't just be the subject of a Security Council resolution and then promptly forgotten and not being brought to people, women in particular, in conflict affected areas, women who in different ways, women human rights defenders worldwide, all of whom are struggling to bring that peace. And I think that we just need to see the tribunal perhaps as part of this broader package of resistance, continuing the struggle. I think um, Gabby said it beautifully, or maybe it was Indai in the documentary, it's not finished. Um, and as Willie also said, you know, we need to continue that resistance. Well, Gabby, I'd like to turn to you and see if you have a couple of closing comments in terms of the legacy of the tribunal. Well, as it relates, if I, if, if I may just go back to your earlier questions, I would commend uh, to uh, anyone, uh, any young lawyer or old lawyer, uh, <laughs> or anyone who is passionate about uh, achieving gender justice, take a look at the judgments because there's still other unfinished business. For example, um, there was a recommendation that the former allies, uh, allied nations declassify all military and governmental records, um, and uh, that an advisory opinion be uh, um, requested from the International Court of Justice and others. So it's not over yet. When I was teaching, many of my students would say, oh, what can we do? What can we do? The civil rights movement is over. Of course, that was 20 years ago, so you will, it, 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 it wasn't over 20 years ago. It's not about uh, over uh, today. So there is still work to be done, and they should be in touch with, uh, you can find Endai. Endai won't let you go if, if, if you call her. <laughs> um, uh, one legacy is, is, as I said before, really, that uh, the governments uh, do not have a monopoly um, on the justice system. Uh, I think we show that, that, that grassroots organization can create an effective tribunal and dispense justice. The other thing is that um, it shows that women can take charge. You know, we know that, that we've been invisible, uh, but, but as I said, uh, it was established primarily by, by women's organizations and led primarily by women. So it tells the international community who we are and what we can do. And I love the question uh, from one member of the audience about using um, um, a tribunal for the Me Too movement. Um, the final thing is something I forgot to mention, Rhonda Copeland. Rhonda Copeland has passed on as well. She was a fine lawyer, professor, activist, and she played such a tremendous role um, in the um, uh, preparation of the final judgment, which you showed uh, Patty to the, to the audience. She came uh, to Tokyo with students uh, uh, and exposed them as well, um, uh, exposed those young women as well to what we were doing. Um, we could go on and on, uh, but I suppose. Look, I, I'm, I'll More thank questions? you. No, and I think the um, uh, last little reflection I'll have before turning it back over to Louise is I think that the world community should have the courage to look the female slave in the eye and to feel her courage, her heart yeah. uh, that will give us 
justice as, as defined uh, by the enslaved. So I wanna thank um, my wonderful friends and panelists and Louise, this has been a fabulous uh, commemoration that gives us really strength to go on. We're in the midst of a historical movement and it's right within our own lives. We should live it in that manner. Louise, back to you. Thank you, Patty. So in concluding, I'd like to make two very short announcements. First, to reiterate the point that Christine has already referred to, that we have actually posted on our website two key documents comprising extracts from the judgment. The first document is um, some of the voices of the brave women who spoke out. We do so because the paradox of legal processes is that all too often it is the victims' voices that are silenced. The second document, as you all now know, comprised key legal passages from the judgment. And you can find the link to both these documents in the chat box. Finally, I'm going to do something a little bit radical here. I invite <laughs> you all to unmute yourselves and to enable your videos. I'm going to give you a few moments to do this. And I do so because I'd like you to join me in thanking our moderator, Patty. So Patty, thank you and our panel members, Gabby, Indai, Christine, for sharing their time and their personal reflections with us today. And I also invite you to join us in taking this opportunity as a moment, perhaps of feminist solidarity, by remembering and thanking all those who made the tribunal possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank this you. was wonderful. Thank you. Brilliant. Bravo, bravo. Wonderful. Uh, Merci. Uh, hi, Madeleine. Hi. <laughs> hi, Madeleine. Brilliant. So Wonderful. Amazing. What a good idea. So lovely to see you. Oh, my God. It's been so long, I tell you. Madeleine. Oh, yeah, hasn't it? So, so many friends here. It's just wonderful. Yeah, really. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Madeleine is a daughter.